Japan's kamikaze pilots were the sacrificial pawns in a game of chess. The role of the Japanese in the Second World War is often relegated to Pearl Harbor and the conclusive surrender after the atomic bombs. To those that dive into the rich traditions of the Japanese culture, the Japanese's military tactics throughout history make it for interesting conversation, especially in the West, where the average person is not necessarily well-versed in the history of Japan the ideas and sentiments of that culture seem foreign. One of these interesting stories was the tale of kamikaze pilots. You might be familiar with the phrase without knowing its significance. The kamikaze is an aerial military unit that flew airplanes for the sake of suicide attacks. In Japanese, kamikaze stands for divine wind or spirit wind. This unit was part of the Japanese special attack units. These units were designed to carry next to no weapons or ammunition. Their job was to aim their planes at the targets. To understand the kamikaze units, one can draw parallels to suicide bombings that became common after 9-11. Another way to understand them is to consider them as drones, except that they were manned by people and never returned. The pilot often died when the plane crashed. To put it plainly, the kamikaze planes were missiles, and the person guiding the machine was a mere formality. We must have some context to understand the kamikaze soldiers the need for such soldiers, and the historic rhetoric that guided this ideological thinking. For starters, let's look at how and why the kamikaze unit began. The Japanese started utilizing these units in the closing stages of the Pacific War, which was the Asian campaign of the Second World War. In this campaign, Japan came into direct conflict with the Chinese in the Second Sino-Japanese War and the Russians in the Soviet-Japanese conflict. In the final chapters of this drawn-out conflict, Japan, now on its back foot, was desperate enough to try a maneuver like deploying suicidal units. Many special units were deployed, the kamikaze being one of them, and they were known as tokubetsu kogekitai, or special attack units. As for the air units, they were called shimpu tokubetsu kogekitai, or divine wind special attack units. Japan pushed the United States to join the Second World War in December 1941 and Japan itself also formally entered the war that same month. However, the kamikaze units did not make waves until October 1944. By this point, Japan had lost most of its pilots. Their aircraft were not as technologically capable as their allied counterparts. With most of their pilots lost to the war and their planes incapable of taking on the enemy fighters, the conundrum was clear. How do you use outdated planes without able pilots? The answer, give rudimentary training to inexperienced pilots and throw them in the cockpits of stripped-down planes. The kamikaze pilots barely knew how to maneuver their planes. These manned missiles were famously sent out to destroy American ships. But why did the soldiers agree to take on this suicidal mission? To understand that, we have to take a look at Japanese culture. The word kamikaze can be traced back to 1281, where a major typhoon dispersed Mongol ships and their foreign invaders. Once again, the word came into widespread use when a plane made a record-breaking flight from Tokyo to London in 1937 and was named kamikaze. The soldiers who brought this term into circulation within the next few years were mostly told to revere and follow the Bushido Code. The roots of the Bushido Code have been deeply embedded in the samurai way of life. The military culture of Japan is littered with examples of strict and disciplined military culture. Often misunderstood outside of Japan due to a reductive approach to tales like the 47 Ronin, the reality of this code was far more complex. For the most part, samurais were not the epitome of moral resilience as modern retellings seek to paint them. However, the idea of loyalty and honor until death has stayed more or less unchanged throughout the centuries. Following this code of discipline and honor, the soldiers had to follow five basic rules. One a soldier must make loyalty his obligation. Two, a soldier must make propriety his way of life. Three, a soldier must highly esteem military valor. Four, a soldier must have high regard for righteousness. And five, a soldier must live a simple life. In theory, these ideas seem very noble. However, the truth was far from it. Much like the misunderstood samurai, the kamikaze pilots were no noble knights in shining armor. Captain Motoharu Okamura, the first officer to officially propose suicidal tactics, said, In our present situation, I firmly believe that the only way to swing the war in our favor 
is to resort to crash dive attacks with our aircraft. There is no other way. There will be more than enough volunteers for this chance to save our country, and I would like to command such an operation. Provide me with 300 aircraft, and I will turn the tide of war." He believed that the volunteers were like a swarm of bees, adding that bees die after they have stung. And so, the recruitment process began. At the time, the conditions in Japan were particularly bleak. Amid the dwindling economy and the psychological burden of the war, volunteers showed up in hordes to take part in the seemingly noble mission. There was twice the number of volunteers than the planes. Some planes ended up carrying two personnel, one to fly the aircraft and the other to keep the pilot's morale high. Several volunteers wanted to show their support for their country so that the authorities would look after their families. When their mission got delayed or fell into limbo, there were reports that some pilots became increasingly desperate and deplorable. The Japanese treatment of this situation was quite the opposite in print and otherwise. The depression and pitiful state of the volunteers were spun as tales of self-sacrifice for a higher purpose. Meanwhile, pilots drank a glass of sake, ate a bowl of rice, and entered their cockpits to fly to their deaths. A manual for kamikaze pilots gives insight into the attitude of the Japanese military. The manual describes the mission of these units in the following words. Transcend life and death. When you eliminate all thoughts about life and death, you will be able to totally disregard your earthly life. This will also enable you to concentrate your attention on eradicating the enemy with unwavering determination, meanwhile reinforcing your excellence in flight skills. Exert the best in yourself. Strike an enemy vessel that is either moored or at sea. Sink the enemy and thus pave the road for our people's victory. The training manual further explained the duty to the volunteers and asked them to take a walk around the airfield to understand the terrain and to look at the weather. Once in the air, it elaborated on the job specifics, explaining that the plane should ideally hit the enemy ships between the bridge tower and the smokestacks. It relayed the areas of the target vehicles that are to be avoided. In addition to covering the practicals, it also offered advice on keeping one's composure moments before the crash and during it. The instructions also emphasized the need for conviction and gave some emotional support. Do your best. Every deity and the spirits of your dead comrades are watching you intently. Just before the collision, it is essential that you do not shut your eyes for a moment so as to not miss the target. Many have crashed into the targets with wide open eyes. They will tell you what fun they had. As they crashed, pilots were also instructed to yell Hisatsu, which translates to sink without fail or certain kill. The pilots wore Senimbari, a belt believed to confer courage and immunity from injury, and carried a Nambu pistol to avoid being captured alive. Not only that, they also brought along a death poem they composed to read in the hour of death. These death poems followed the tradition of samurai, who read them before committing harikiri or seppuku, ritual suicide. They also shaved their heads to face death with a certain purity, and face death they did. With no weapons for offense and no gadgets to facilitate defense, survival seemed impossible. As absurd as it may seem, some kamikaze pilots survived their missions. The planes had just enough fuel to reach their targets and not enough to return, and reaching the targets was not easy. In the beginning, the special unit caught the Allied forces by surprise, but once demystified, the kamikaze pilots were not an issue for the Americans. Most aircraft were shot down from a distance, and few managed to reach their intended targets. The pilots who survived were the ones who had to return to the base due to equipment malfunction early in the flight. The initial attacks were carried out in the Battle of Leyte in the Philippines. After some early success, the Japanese tried their newfound strategy against the Boeing B-29s. The special unit may have enjoyed success against warships, but planes were not easy targets. A warship is relatively more stationary. Planes are always moving at high speeds. As such, they would often maneuver away from the suicidal threats and take out the kamikaze planes from afar. In early 1945, the U.S. Navy employed a new approach to protecting their warships. The Big Blue Blanket strategy neutralized the kamikaze units by patrolling reconnaissance planes 50 miles away from the carriers. This way, the Americans had prior knowledge, almost like a radar, and fighter jets would be dispatched to take care of the oncoming missiles. The U.S. pilots were experienced and had better knowledge than the Japanese fighters. They could take them out precisely without putting themselves in any significant danger. 
the frequency of kamikaze attacks increased in the final days of the war. Nevertheless, the Allies understood the threat quite well by this point, and they did not sustain many losses. Despite its somewhat initial success, the kamikaze unit could not inflict more significant damage. The Japanese lost around 3,000 pilots using this tactic and, according to the Japanese announcements, sunk 81 ships and damaged another 195. These figures are disputed, as some U.S. historians claim that no more than 70 ships were damaged beyond repair. Others argue that the number was even lower, somewhere around 57. Despite these lackluster results, the Japanese authorities boosted morale with tales of courage and bravery in the papers and books. They hailed the volunteers, who shared ceremonial cups of sake as heroes before departing to their puritanical sacrifice. However, the reality was quite different. The kamikaze pilots had to barrel in on their targets with no training on how to flank enemy vehicles or avoid their fire. It is quite surprising that some managed to get through by sheer luck. To some idealists, the idea of a man going to sacrifice his life for his country sounds courageous. On the other hand, some rationalists claim it to be nothing more than an abuse of power and mishandling of available resources and manpower. How you choose to look at it is entirely up to you. To learn more about the fascinating lives of kamikaze pilots, check out our book, Pearl Harbor, a captivating guide to the surprise military strike by the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service that caused the United States of America's formal entry into World War II. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while they're still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.